and welcome again to another program of Searching for Answers. My name is Carolyn Thompson, and on my right is... Richard Rice, School of Religion, Loma Linda University. Gerald Winslow, the Medical Center at Loma Linda University. John Jones, La Sierra University. Ivan Blazin, Loma Linda University. I would ask the audience, the listeners, wherever you are, whether you're on the computer or whatever, if you will gather your Bibles together, different versions of the Bible, we are in the book of John, a wonderful, wonderful book. And we are presently in chapter 16. And I'm going to ask my good friend John Jones to tell us a little bit about what we've been studying in chapter 16 and tell us just where are we, uh, verse wise. Well, <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, right. This is Jesus kind of leave taking final <coughs> visit discourse with mm -hmm. his disciples. And we were remarking a bit ago how interesting that section right in the middle or near the middle around verse 12, 13, and 14 where we have that interesting expression. It's used three times in John and nowhere else in the Old or the New Testament, the spirit of truth. Mm -hmm. And we were remarking at uh, how special and unusual that is in a way. Mm -hmm. Trying to hook it in with the fact that Go the Gospel of John is the last of the four that we have in the New Testament, uh, written some decades after the life of Jesus. The experience of the early Christians is playing out now, and, and, and they have learned something about what this spirit of truth may really be all about. Um, other, uh, let me not simply expatiate on this, but uh, give colleagues a shot at it. Sure, here. Ivan. Well, I am impressed by these, uh, as far as the spirit of truth, mm -hmm. um, by verse 8. Well, maybe we should look at verse 7. I tell you, I it's tell chapter, you. chapter, excuse me, yeah, 16. Chapter 16, verse, verse 7. Verse 7, all right. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, and this is the part that I think be helpful perhaps to open up a little bit. When he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and about righteousness and about judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you will see me no longer. What's the connection between proving the world wrong about righteousness and Jesus going to the Father and about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. Hmm. Now that's a section I think we need to uh, open up a little bit more. Okay, how about Rick Rice here? Opening this up, I think, <laughs> 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 I think I'll defer to Ivan on that <laughs> because uh, he had the thought that judgment, and I'm, I'm, I hope I've got it right, Ivan, the ruler of this world has been condemned. Mm. Right. That's right. So it's, it's as if there's a, a dramatic conflict that's taking place. Exactly. And that uh, what the ruler of the world stands for, the values, the standards, and so on, uh, Jesus has been opposing, and uh, in light of his ministry, it now stands condemned. So I think it's a way of reassuring the disciples that uh, a dramatic transition has taken place that the order of things that they probably had a way of putting Jesus within to say we, we, can, we can sort of understand you mm -hmm. now within the framework of, uh, of what works and what doesn't, yes. of what's, uh, what's powerful and what isn't. And Jesus in a sense is, is contradicting all of that. And I think it's that crisis, if we can use that word, where Jesus is showing that the values of this world and the things we tend to admire in the way of knowledge, in the way of power, Whatever it is, Jesus is contradicting that by his ministry. Mm -hmm. And so it should not be surprising to the disciples that they're, in a sense, on the outside looking in on mm. the world. Whereas before, I think they wanted to put Jesus within their framework of understanding. Yeah. So it's that, it's that revolutionary, uh, that revolution of values that Jesus is presenting to them as if to say, you've now got to look at things in an entirely different way. Mm. I'd like to say a word about judgment since we mentioned this. You know, it's the prince of this world who is condemned. That means he has come before the judgment. You have to say the name. 
um, say the name? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it he says here. He goes by Princeton. many names. He goes he? by many names. We call him the devil or we call him Satan. There you here go. Here he's called the, the ruler of this world. That's verse 11. That's right. verse 11, yeah. And uh, I'm interested, as I said, in the judgment idea. And interestingly to me, it is Satan who is judged. And the reason I find that of interest is because I find many people in the church who are afraid of the judgment. Mm. And they're afraid that if they stand there in the judgment, they won't make it. You know, they wonder what's going to happen. So in that connection, I would like to read one other judgment text in John, which is of interest, I think, along this line. Uh, verse 24 of chapter 5. Mm -hmm. <coughs> This, this verse is very interesting. Now, in my version, it says very truly. And that's very good, and that's strong. But uh, I, I, I would like to uh, say, this is the truth, this is the truth. The word verily means mm -hmm. truth. Mm -hmm. It's a verity. This is the truth, this is the truth. Well, now, what is the big truth that Jesus s twice speaks of here? I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment. Carolyn, you have it, 524? Mm -mm. Yeah, chapter That's 5. Okay. okay. Does not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, we have already crossed the Jordan River, mm -hmm. and we're on the other side. And this should give great hope. It may be that Satan, it is, is, is judged and he's condemned. But we're not going to be condemned. If we put our trust in Jesus, we've crossed the river, and life is ours already in the present time. But Ivan, let me just ask you, though, that helps me understand the part about judgment in, in verse 11. Yeah. But those other two parts seem, there are three parts here, right? Yeah. The, the other two seem a little mysterious to me. Um, when, when the Spirit comes, or the Advocate, or the Helper, uh, we have different translations. Mm -hmm. When He comes, He'll prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, three things. About sin because they do not believe in Me. Now, yeah. I can imagine an interpretation of that. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will see Me no longer. Let me just admit that that puzzles me. Well, I find it a bit difficult myself. but. Um, He's going to convict the world about judgment. It, maybe it goes down like this. He will do that. I'm going back to my Father. But when the Spirit comes, mm -hmm. He's going to take up this matter <laughs> of righteousness mm -hmm. and, and really develop it. You see. Well, I mean, maybe we should look at it from the a viewpoint that who was the original uh, critical of, of God the Father? Who was criticizing him uh, in a very way that a lot of people didn't, a lot of the angels did not quite understand it. But he was critical of the way God was ruling the universe. And uh, so, therefore, Satan, when he's been condemning God, will himself be condemned because he's proved to be wrong. But God is still being judged, isn't he? Yeah, that's an interesting concept, God being judged, but that's uh, important. Yes. In theodicy, we talk yeah. about the vindication of God over right. against charges that could be made. Look at this world. In fact, that's, that's probably one of the biggest charges of all. I heard someone recently say uh, in a book, well, it's this famous lawyer, Bugliosi, he wrote this book, The Divinity of Doubt. Hmm. And in there he says, you know, he doesn't know if God exists. He doesn't say he doesn't. He's agnostic about the matter. But what he does say is the Christian God cannot exist because the Christian God is said to be all-loving hmm. and all-powerful. So how on earth can we be seeing what we are seeing? So if he accepts some concept of God, it won't be the Christian concept. That's what he's saying. Now, that's where we have our business in our course, you know, that we teach God and human suffering. How to put this together. Mm. 
It's even frightening to have a title of a course like that, God and Human Suffering. How can you put the two things in the same phrase? Yes. If there's human suffering, it raises the question about God. But thank God for God. If there's God, then there may be an answer, all right. There is an answer to human suffering. But that is a biggie. Vincent Bugliosi is on to something. I think probably more people have lost their faith <coughs> around those issues that's than right. anything else. It's Absolutely. Absolute oh, I think that's yeah. true. Well, <coughs> at, at a minimum, from the passage we looked at, I, I think we can say there's sin and there's righteous, there is righteousness and there's a contrast. And judgment is the separation of the two or the decision about yeah. which is which. And the decisive difference, it seems to me, in this passage is the way people choose to relate to Jesus and um, the belief right. as to whether or not he represents um, the Father. Yeah. I mean, that's, right. the, that's yeah. the dividing line between whether you end up on the side of yes. sin on the one hand or yeah. righteousness it's, it's on It's really the other. sharp now. It's sharp. It's, it's a very strong you contrast. Know, those of us who have our roots in Adventism and have had our souls shaped by our Adventist heritage often are uncomfortable with the th thought of the spirit uh, simply because we don't know what to make of it. And the interpretations and the, the uh, picture that's painted of the role and ministry mm -hmm. of the spirit just doesn't quite march in step with the way we experience our religious lives. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is interesting here though that this is not the spirit of, of grandiose uh, demonstrations of uh, Pentecostal or charismatic wonder working there's nothing sensational about this, which is, uh, those are the very moments where we get uncomfortable. Rather, it is the spirit of truth. And um, interestingly enough, I think Seventh-day Adventism has been more obsessed and interested keenly in questions of truth than of anything else. Uh, it seems to me that um, this understanding of the spirit should certainly be one that Adventists can especially appreciate and and appropriate in their own religious experience. And it seems to me too that um, what we have here is a, a, a need for a version or an understanding of inspiration that allows for an ongoing process. That is to say, mm. we have Paul in his letter to the church at Corinth, chapter 14. He says, look at you, here's one of you, stands up, has a prayer, another a message from the Lord, another a hymn, another uh, uh, tongue speaking, and how are we to understand all of this? Um, Paul does not disallow any of it. He does say, take turns and right. be nice about this now. Regulate it. <laughs> Regulate it and all things decently yeah. and in order. But <clears throat> nonetheless, he apparently has a mental model in which people in the worship service of the early church could stand up and say, I have a message from the Lord tonight. It's a word from the Lord. It's just as much a word from the Lord as any of these pronouncements that we have in the Gospels. And yet it's an ongoing process. Uh, it apparently uh, calls us to think afresh about the dynamic of the Christian experience in the early church and ways in which the Lord might still continue speaking with us yet today. Uh, tying on that, I, I, and help me with this, but I, I think there may be a similarity there between what Paul is saying to the Corinthians and what John is saying here. Yes. In that, it's the spirit that underlies the whole relationship yeah. within this community. Yeah. Uh, as I recall, he says in uh, sort of the preface to his discussion of different gifts, you all have the spirit. Yes. So it's like saying, look, mm -hmm. don't feel that if some of you uh, have different abilities or different responsibilities that you have the spirit and the others who don't have, yeah. don't have it. It's like, you all have the spirit. That is the one thing that unifies you. And I think in many ways, John is making the same point. What makes you a community is the spirit that I'm giving you. It's your connection with me through the spirit. Now, what that means is, I think we'll have to spend a lot of time talking about, <laughs> uh, one, one scholar explained it this way in, in a way that has remained with me. He said, look, in every community, there's a kind of, uh, what would you call it, a, a community spirit or a yeah. dynamic mm -hmm. or just a sense of what it is that makes this community what it is. You know, we like to have school spirit or mm -hmm. at, at mm -hmm. Loma Linda University where a lot of us are connected or La Sierra University. What's the dynamic here? And the, 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 the author I'm citing said, you know what it is? Every community has that in the church. It's the spirit that provides that sense of community. 
Hmm. It's the participation in that spirit that makes the community a community. And I think when we look at the church and we realize how diverse the people are here, and you pointed to some of the diversities, the differences in economy and culture and background, and you say, how could, how could those kind of people <laughs> be part of one entity and enjoy fellowship with one another? Well, it has to be something beyond just the, th the ordinary things that bring people together, like common hobbies or economic, socioeconomic group or for professional interests. There's something more going on here. That's right. And I think that, that may direct our minds toward the work of the mm -hmm. Spirit is to create community. Yeah. It yeah. was a problem in Corinth because people of a certain economic group were getting together and having the Lord's Supper first, and then others coming along later who were of a different class. They could afford a nicer menu. Uh, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, so, but look at but them also fighting yeah. it out with each other in the yeah. first few chapters that's of that right. book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He thinks of it as a community of the Spirit, but they're not manifesting. Well, he says, when he starts talking about the spiritual gifts, remember, he's, he lists them in chapter 12, and then he says at the end of chapter 12, but I'll show you a more excellent way, and that excellent way is the way of love, which happens to be the big mm -hmm. right here, reality. Yeah. Right this here. is Tama. Right. Love and the Spirit go hand in hand. So the, the really, when you think of it that way, one, if you were looking for signs of the Spirit, among the first you'd look for would be an emphasis on truth. Mm -hmm. Does it matter that uh, th these things are true? And you would look for a spirit of, of love, of neighbor love, because that would be uh, real evidence know. of the adven uh, adventure of living with the yeah. Spirit. And, and that's I, how I would you know that, uh, that's how people will know that you're my disciples. Right. I would connect the love and the, and the truth. The ultimate truth is, is the love of God that comes to us through the, through the Spirit. We're very doctrinaire when we read the word yeah. truth. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. When I was, I was uh, in New York City as a young guy studying there, and there came a knock on the door, and there was a Jewish, young Jewish insurance salesman, mm -hmm. and he wanted to sell me life insurance. <laughs> so he started in on a canvas that was very well memorized, and somehow original sin <laughs> rose up within me, no. and I said, I, uh, no, no. "Well, I said I've got to break his canvas," <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I kind of broke in and everything, and kind of shook him up for a moment, and then he went back to the beginning. <laughs> he started in again, <laughs> and again, original sin <laughs> rose up, and I broke it again, and finally we just—he wasn't going to go back there. Finally, we just started talking, and in the course of it, he told me that he was dating a Christian girl. Wow. Really? Yeah, I think it was a Presbyterian girl. Now, this <laughs> is highly unusual for a Jewish person mm -hmm. to be doing it. Um, but he, he's, and he says, you know, she asked me if I would go to church with her. So this is unusual for a Jew to do. And he said, I went to church with her. And then here, here was his conclusion about church, a Christian church service. He said, you Christians talk a lot about doctrine, mm -hmm. but it, you do not show me how to walk, how to conduct mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. footsteps mm -hmm. in this world. And the love thing, you know, if you love me, keep my mm -hmm. command, that would be, yeah. that would be, you know, but walking, that's part of the Torah, is it not? Mm -hmm. One part of the Halakha. Torah is halakha halak, <coughs> to walk. How do you walk? That's, uh, that is the point. So truth is larger than doctrine. It may include doctrine, of course. Doctrine is important. But the way of love, the walk of love, is the most. And isn't important. there a biblical expression, "doing the truth"? Yes, there is. There is. Yeah. Which suggests that there's a, a kind of a solidarity here between what you believe and how you live. That's right. That sometimes we disconnect. I think. Well, yeah. The it whole relationship between believing and behaving and belonging would make right a great know. book, uh, <laughs> Doctor Rice. Yeah, I know one like. I that. think so too. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, uh, it may be a surprise to some of our viewers that uh, some people become uneasy about discussions of the action of the Spirit in the church, and yeah. I've wondered about that. Yeah. Now, maybe I'm wrong about that, uh, but what I think I've detected is a certain, the, the anxiety about the work of the Spirit is that it seems, uh, in a sense, unruly. What do you mean, unruly? It's unpredictable. 
the you spirit is unpredictable? You can't control it. I mean, even Jesus says in an earlier passage yeah. in John, it's like the wind, it, it blows right. where it where will. It will. You see what's happening, but mm. you can't control it, it uh, any more than you can control the wind. And uh, if, you, if your emphasis on truth is that it's more predictable, that it's more stipulated, it's laid out, and then you emphasize the immediacy of the spirit, mm -hmm. that sense of adventure, enthusiasm, enchantment, if you will, with the world um, is potentially um, unruly. I, don't, I can't think of a better word. I, it's potentially disorderly and uh, isn't part of the um, difficulty that Paul is having in, uh, the, as he, with, the, with the Corinthians as he writes to them the first letter, is a kind of disorderliness yes. uh, based on their encounter with the Spirit. So I don't know what that all leads to other than I don't, I don't sense any of that here in yeah. these passages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there's, no, there's no threat that this will lead to disorderliness no. or um, unpredictable. But isn't it interesting, Jerry, you say the Spirit is unpredictable mm -hmm. and all that, and, and it's true. You can't regulate the Spirit, and yet that's precisely what Paul does in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. You can control You yourself. have to control <laughs> it. You know, you've got to have, you know, two or three speak and no more than that and so on. So it's up to the church to control in a sense. I don't know if the word control is the best word, but control the manifestation of the Spirit or direct. Mm -hmm. Or at least assess the manifestations of yeah, the Spirit. Yeah, it has to do way. that for sure. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, You have to t explain it to me because I didn't know that we controlled the Spirit. I thought the Spirit well, was controlling us if we ask Him to. You're, you're right, and, and that's a beautiful thought, too. But in 1 Corinthians 14, these Spirit people that Corinthians oh, thought of themselves as spirit well, go people. Go to First Corinthians 14 and read that. Well, 12 and 13 and 14. Oh, these are all okay. chapters together, but in in uh, in that chapter 14, he does make it clear that it is the congregation's job not to let its experience of the Spirit, the experience of the Spirit, get out of hand. It can't get out of hand at times, and it does in that chapter. Uh, each one, he says, someone's got a ha a psalm, someone's got a hymn, someone's got a prophecy. And they're all doing them, uh, these things all at the same time. Is that the Spirit? Well, That's he, the question. <laughs> well, I don't think so. Well, well, those gifts are gifts of the Spirit, mm -hmm. prophecy and tongues and this and that. They're all gifts of the Spirit, but the congregation can misuse it. Mm. It isn't that the ki Spirit comes in and makes sure that there's no misuse. Would well, you agree it, with that? Well, he calls them prophets. Prophet. If, you know, two, three prophets speak. That's prophecy. He, he, he never <laughs> questions that. But it's, I think it's okay. born of a kind of misunderstanding, uh, I think Paul would say, is a misunderstanding of the work of the Spirit, too. Um, I think of an analogy. We lived in another culture once, uh, my family and, uh, and I. And uh, I won't even name the other culture, but um, our younger daughter was in the elementary school mm -hmm. there. And uh, it, it, the classroom was chaos. <laughs> and I was shocked because I always thought of this culture as very yeah. orderly, but the classroom was chaos. And so finally one day I asked the principal with whom I'd become friends about that. And he said to me, well, we've gone too far with democracy. <laughs> and, and I thought, what a strange answer, too far <laughs> with democracy, as if democracy would be chaos. And so I wanted to argue with him a little bit <laughs> because I'd like to stick up for democracy and say, there's nothing wrong mm. with democracy. No. There is something wrong with anarchy, yeah. which is what we've got going here. And th the reason I think of that as an analogy is I, I think that what was going on to some extent, Carolyn, in, in the Corinthian experience was a kind of anarchy or chaos that was attributed to the spirit. But it wasn't the spirit. Well, I think Paul is saying you need to you need to get some order in there. But he doesn't say it isn't the Spirit. He okay. really doesn't. Rick Rice is on the edge of his oh, seat. He wants to <laughs> jump right in here. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, th I think there, th th something you said earlier about Paul's discourse there, um, the, the part of the First Corinthians where he talks about the Spirit, is significant, and that is right in the middle. He talks about love. Yeah. And that's, that's the ultimate fruit of the Spirit is love. And I think what, what's happening here in John, if we were to sort of bring another element in here to mm -hmm. say the sort of the, 
the acid test, if you will, of the, the authentic work of the Spirit is to generate community. That's right. I think another assessment here, another keystone or, or, or a, a test would be its connection with Christ. The Spirit that comes, the Spirit that I'm giving you will be a Spirit that perpetuates my ministry among yeah. you yeah. and that will be identified with me. And so right. I think it's, right. does the Spirit lead us to Christ? Does this, the, or does the purported manifestation of the Spirit connect us with Christ and does it produce, uh, does it lead us to uh, a relationship of love with one another? I think those are the two primary manifestations uh, or, or primary ways or criteria of assessing whether a manifestation of the Spirit is really one that we should accept yeah, or not. Yeah, and there's another thing in chapter 12. I might mention this, Carol, of First Corinthians. Uh, it says, Let G uh, no one can say, this is verse 3, Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. That the very confession that we make Mm -hmm. as to the, you know, the highest confession we can make, Jesus is Lord, is one indicted by the Spirit. Well, and it's on that basis that he says, I know you all have the Spirit because you, you've confessed Christ is Lord. So yeah. let's, let's not limit the Spirit to people who have this gift or that, that gift. Let's say, look, you're all part of the community. Yeah. You've all confessed Christ. You have the Spirit. Okay. Now let's go on from there. Yeah, that's good. Um, we're coming to the end of this segment, and we'll try to continue on next time. But it looks to me that there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they each have a role that they play in this universe. And uh, perhaps we can uh, explore a little bit more what the Holy Spirit or what the Spirit of Truth, what He's all about. And so tune in next time. We'll continue this subject. Until then, this is Carolyn Thompson.